All right, I guess we're doing this. Topology with T-Splines in Fusion 360. This is a video about topology. Essentially, how do we think through and plan out the construction of T-Spline geometry to make something look the way we intend? We'll look at some semi-practical examples, and hopefully by the end, we'll at least have an understanding that topology is a term that exists. Anyway, let's start by making something. This may seem like review for a few seconds, but it's really just to tee things up. So let's hit create form and we'll make something simple. We can start with a basic plane. Doesn't really matter where it is at this point, so that's fine. And to make it even simpler, we'll make this one by one face. Okay, so now we have a T-spline body in the sculpt environment. So edit form will be our main tool with T-splines. We can move around faces, edges, vertices, and if you hold Alt or Option while moving either a face or an edge, we can build on this geometry. But let's pause for a moment because there's something big happening here. And if you're familiar with poly or subdivision modeling, you probably already know where we're going with this. We've done essentially the same command on two different elements of the geometry. One on a face, one on an edge, and these two ways seem similar, but they are so fundamentally different in approach that they split creating things with T-splines into two separate modeling strategies. One, where we create geometry by extruding faces. Some call this box modeling because the underlying geometry looks like it's made from boxes. And the other, we can call edge modeling, where we extrude individual faces from edges. It's important to note here that neither of these strategies are right or wrong, and both can reach the same result in the end. We can also mix the two, but they require different ways of thinking. If I were to put difficulty levels on these strategies, edge modeling would be medium, and box modeling would be both easy and hard at the same time. This is because with box modeling, it's very easy to make something, perhaps one of the easiest modeling methods in all of Fusion, but what are we making with it? The forms to start out with are very blobby and undefined, and to get definition we now have to go in there with various tools and edit how the underlying mesh is defined. This can be quite difficult on complex models. With edge modeling, on the other hand, we try to create that definition from the very beginning, and in my opinion, that makes it easier to get refined surfaces that look the way we want them to. So for that reason, we'll focus mostly on edge modeling in this video. And once we get more comfortable, we can start using box modeling as a shortcut for quickly blocking out forms. And now we move on to the word of the day, topology. To understand sculpting with T-splines is to understand the idea of topology for T-spline bodies. This is essentially the flow of faces and edges on a model. By changing this flow, we can change how the resulting model behaves. And since different flows give different results, we need to figure out the ideal ways of creating topologies that give us clean resulting surfaces that match our design intent. Some terms that might help us out a bit here are edge loops, face loops, and rings. In the context of Fusion 360, these are selection modifiers for selecting continuous groups of edges or faces. You can find these all in the edit form toolbox. But for this video, we don't need to worry about any of these as buttons. It's more important to understand these terms in the context of how they define the model. So an edge loop looks like this. It's a continuous connected group of edges. And similarly, a face loop is a continuous connected group of faces. And finally, a ring looks like this. These are the edges between faces in a face loop. One thing to note here is that a face loop and a ring, when we are referring to the topology of a model, might be used interchangeably because you can't have one without the other. So if you saw a couple of my other videos and heard ring around the detail, or maybe saw a polymodeling tutorial that mentions a ring, you can make that defining ring by creating a face loop. We'll get into this more as we start looking at examples. So how does this apply to edge modeling, and how do we start? Ring around the detail is something that I heard in an old 3ds Max tutorial that stuck with me, but let's change it up a bit to make it a little bit more clear. Maybe. When we are starting a T-spline model, we want to first determine the defining edges and features on our model then create face loops that follow those features. For those face loops, we'll want to determine an appropriate density of faces for a model that's roughly evenly spaced. We can adjust the spacing in certain parts of the model to create less or more curvature acceleration. Then we'll take those face loops and fill in the gaps to complete the form. Okay, let's look at this brush in a little more detail. This is just some random brush I have in my kitchen. 
we can break down how this is put together. The first step is to figure out where the defining detail areas are on the model. And there are only a few. There's an elliptical profile here on the bottom, and there's a sharp edge that runs around the front that blends out around here. And it'll be helpful for us to also call out the center line here as well. So those are the details that are going to drive our topology. Now we need to define the face loops that'll create those details. Let's start with the edge at the front. For now, let's assume that this will be a creased edge that we'll end up filleting, and we'll look at another way to do this later. So we need to define this edge. For this, we'll create two face loops, one on either side of the edge, so here and here. Then we'll need another face loop to define the ellipse on the bottom. For now, we won't worry about the flat surface on the bottom. There are many ways we can take care of that later. We can also assume that we can take these face loops and continue them through to form the back of the handle. These are going to be our defining face loops. Now we can figure out how this gets broken up into individual faces. To do this, we can ask a couple questions. Where do details exist or stop? Like where the filled at edge will terminate. And where will face loops change direction? Like this point at the front of the brush. Essentially, what are we defining and where will we need to have higher densities in order to get the detail we need? A good starting point is to think about defining this with as low density of a mesh as possible to define the detail we need. It's good to keep in mind here that lower density meshes are usually preferred because they're easier to manage, and keeping things roughly evenly spaced is also usually preferred unless you want the curvature to change. So in our case, the turning point of this front nose section and the end point of this creased edge will be good places to start. There's going to be one edge loop that runs around the center line, and now we can see roughly what the spacing of these faces and edges want to be. If we think about even spacing, we can finish defining this creased edge. This will be the spacing that will drive the rest of the model. We can continue these face loops all the way to the back of the handle. There's some tighter curvature at the transition to the handle, so we may want to adjust the tension in that area by making the spacing a little closer together. We can use the spacing we've defined to also create the face loop around the elliptical profile. And with that, we have all the defining face loops on the model. Now we just weld things together if needed and fill the gaps to finish defining the topology. And don't forget that this will be a creased edge for now. On the bottom, we could take several approaches. We could create another face loop if there were detail here that we needed to worry about. We could also leave it open as is and use patch tools to define a perfectly flat surface. We'll cover a little on that approach later. For now, we can take the simplest approach and just fill faces across the gap. A quick way to do this is with the bridge tool. And that is the main body of the brush before any details. While we're talking about tools, in the sculpt environment, there are several tools for editing geometry. And if we have a hard time figuring out what to use when, there's an easy way to break down the tool set. On a basic level, all of these tools do one of three things. We are either creating faces, creating edges within faces, or welding and combining edges or vertices. That said, we can do almost all the T-spline modeling tasks with only three of these tools, edit form, insert point, and weld vertices. I found these to be the base level tools with the most control for doing almost everything. The other tools offer shortcuts for making specific tasks faster, like bridging gaps, for example. If we understand these core tools, then it's easy to understand the rest just by reading the descriptions. Just a quick note on mirroring, there are two types, duplicate and internal. I only call this out because the default tool in the toolbar is mirror internal, but everything we'll look at in this video is done with mirror duplicate. Internal is good if the object you're working with already has symmetry, like a box for example. And duplicate is good if you want to start by modeling one side, then create a mirrored copy of that side, which is what we're doing with the models in this video. One of the things I like most about T-splines is the ability to create variations in surface transitions to determine which is best. So for example, if we don't like how this filleted edge is terminating, we can do a couple more options to see which is best. We can make a copy of our original, then we can go in here and change the topology we defined. There's an initial bevel we need to do to replace the fillet, but we need to control how this flows into the rest of the model. There are many ways to do this, but for me, insert point and weld vertices are the main tools. This allows us to quickly change the flow, and now, instead of relying on filleting a creased edge, we now have much more control over how the blend is constructed. In this case, 
Instead of coming to a sharp point, it's a soft blend. We need to be mindful of how the new loops we are adding flow with the rest of the model. Generally, we should be thinking about how to make the edge and face loops as continuous as possible. Having breaks in the flow are inevitable, but the less of them we have, the better the surface quality. So here we can see the difference in the transition. If we were surface modeling this, it would take an entirely new construction of this area to make this type of change. There are some common problems that can happen with tooth blinds that many of us will run into. So let's see how we can fix some of the more confusing ones. If you use vertex selection in edit form, you've probably encountered some extra handles that are otherwise not accessible. For most things we do with teeth blinds, we shouldn't touch these. They are useful, especially when transitioning to other non-teeth spline geometry, but for a pure teeth spline model, they tend to cause problems. If you do happen to edit them, you'll notice that the handles turn red. To fix this, while editing in vertex mode, we can select all the vertices we want to relink and select link tangent handles. Another common issue sometimes happens when editing while in smooth display mode. There will be problems in the surface even though the edges seem to be in the right spot. Switching over to box display mode can help us see all kinds of problems. I'll often use this mode while defining the entire initial topology of a model. Box display mode will also help with getting proper spacing especially with a higher density mesh. There are some unexpected things that can happen sometimes with T-splines, but there are a couple tools to fix these if they happen. So let's look at this faucet real quick to see a couple of these issues and how to fix them. If we look at this in box mode, it looks like it should be fine. A little suggestive perhaps, but fine. But if we switch over to smooth display, the result is not what we should expect. So how do we fix this? There's a repair body tool that highlights various problem areas, like faces that are not four-sided, errors and intersections, things like that, and it has a couple simple tools to help fix them. Sometimes an auto repair will fix everything, but this one is a little more tricky because Fusion doesn't see it as an error. But there is a hint for us that is called out on the model. On the bottom here, it shows these faces as being three-sided, but they aren't. So what's going on here? This is because it's treating this point as a T-point. T-points are great, and we'll look at them later, but it isn't what we want here. In the Repair Body tool, we can convert to and from T-points by simply clicking on that point. In all honesty, working with T-points is what I use the Repair Body tool for most often. So there's no more error with the geometry, but it still doesn't seem quite right. Again, the spacing on our base geometry seems fine, but when viewing it in smooth mode, the spacing seems off. We can fix this by using the Make Uniform tool on the body. Problem solved. This doesn't change the base mesh at all. It only affects how it's interpolated. Honestly, I don't know why this tool needs to exist. I mean, why is the T-spline body not uniform in the first place? But at least there's a way to fix it. Oftentimes, I'll run this command on all T-spline bodies before leaving the sculpt environment, just to be sure. T-points are a great way to terminate edge loops within geometry. They are especially helpful when you want to step up or down in the resolution of the mesh like we're doing here on this faucet handle. T-points are often created automatically with T-splines when adding edges within the geometry. But as we saw before, we can control this with the Repair Body tool. Now, there's a general rule that with both poly or sub-D modeling and T-splines, that they tend to favor four-sided faces. Going with three or five, sometimes even more than five, is more likely to give unfavorable results. T-points change this rule. Here we have a face with five edges, but because of how T-points are interpolated, the resultant surface is still clean. If we change this back to a star point with a more traditional five-edge face, we can see how the result is not nearly as clean. T-points don't work for everything, and as we saw before, it's sometimes not the desired approach. But it's one of the benefits over traditional poly or sub-D modeling that's valuable to learn about. As far as this video goes, this is the only T-point on any of these models. The rest take a more classic approach to loop terminations. All right, let's try making something a little more complicated. I thought it'd be fun to make a creepy mask for Halloween. It's not even remotely close to Halloween anymore, but whatever. The idea is to figure out the topology of a face. Then we can exaggerate some of the features to make it a little bit more Halloween-y. I am no expert at modeling faces, so we'll quickly look at how this was done first, then we'll look at a better topology and see how these things could have been done better. If we go back to our approach, 
we need to find the defining areas on our model. If you need a starting reference, you can use virtually any photo of yourself or someone else, because once we have the base topology, it's relatively easy to modify it into whatever we want. So where are the details on here? We can start with the eyes, brow ridge, mouth, nostrils, cheeks, and one more face loop that will define the outer edge of our mask. There are some more loops that will radiate out from these. Then it's just a matter of filling the gaps, being mindful of trying not to break the flow. So this is what I came up with for the topology of a face, but I'm not running the business of modeling faces, so we should look at another example. Before we go, let's make this thing extra creepy by giving it teeth. All right, I don't remember where this model came from, but they did a few things differently that I would probably try if I were to do this again. It's a higher density mesh, which I typically don't like to deal with, but the flow of faces on this model are very well thought out. How they define the brow ridge so that it loops around and also defines the bottom of the nose works really well here. This seems to be a rather common technique from some of the resources online. If we look at just the defining loops on this model, we can see how deliberate they were with how the flow is laid out. I didn't want to go into too much detail here because there are better resources out there for this topic. If you want to learn more about modeling faces, you can search for face topology and you will find many resources. They will probably be for a 3D animation package like Max, Blender, C4D, or any other, but the core idea is the same. You can apply the same thinking, the same topology, to a T-spline model in Fusion. We can also import the unsubdivided meshes into T-splines within Fusion, which is what this model is. It wasn't modeled in Fusion, it's an imported OBJ, but it works just the same. This means in theory that we can work with other external software or artists that use other tools and still have the ability to edit within Fusion. One approach that I use quite often with T-splines is to mix it with other modeling methods within Fusion. Technically, it is possible to do nearly anything with T-splines, but it's often not the best tool for the job. Without delving too deep into Class A surfacing terminology, one of the main drawbacks of T-splines is that it's hard to keep good overall surface quality, especially when we have complex topology with many driving loops. For example, if we wanted to make a proper round hole within a T-spline body, we would have to consider how the topology of that hole transitions to the rest of the body. This isn't particularly difficult if we have only one, but what if there were multiple? There are entire polymodeling tutorials dedicated to just showing you how to make holes in various topology layouts. But we're in Fusion 360, so why would we do this? We have the ability to simply cut a perfect circle every time, or any other shape for that matter. It's this mixing of modeling methods that, for me, is what makes T-splines inside Fusion so powerful for concept models. Let's take this controller part, for example. T-splines, by its very nature, is more gestural in how it treats form. So defining precise detail like these would take considerable time and still may not give clean surfaces. Instead, what we can do is use T-splines for what it's particularly good at, creating complex surfaces, and use parametric modeling for all the details. For this video, I've only modeled the top of the controller, but the same approach could continue to the bottom as well. We won't delve too much into surface modeling here, there are other resources for that, but the general idea for this one is to overbuild, then trim away the sections of detail, like the top of the controller here, or where the thumbsticks are, and use various patch tools like loft to complete the form. This would be much faster than trying to make it with T-splines, and gives a rather clean result. I know this video doesn't go into enough detail for those just starting out with T-splines, but hopefully it can point toward what to look into in practice. It may not seem like there are many resources out there for figuring out T-spline topology, and technically that may be true, but once we start looking into poly or subdivision modeling tutorials, there are tons of resources out there. The core concept, topology, is the same among all of them whether it's 3ds Max, Blender, even Gravity Sketch now has a subdivision surface mode. I mean, sure, there are some differences. T-points are a good example of this. But there isn't much difference in how you think through a model. Now suddenly six or so tutorials turns into thousands, and most of them know a lot more than I do about topology. I'll link a couple below. That's just about the end for now. Hope it wasn't a complete waste of time. So normally I'd put disclaimers at the beginning but I felt it made more sense here. Don't treat the things in this video as being absolute truths. There's a lot of opinion built into some of these topics, and it's quite likely that some of the things in this video are just wrong. In fact, I hope there's something in this video that frustrates somebody enough to make their own tutorial. To be honest, that's what actually spawned the initial idea for this video. 
Our collective knowledge on this topic is really only as good as the resources that are available for it and our ability to share our understanding with others. That sounded a little preachy, but I know that there are people out there who really know T-splines inside and out, yet the resources still seem to be lacking. I mean, I'm excited to still be learning, along with everyone else. Anyway, call to arms over, I guess. I'll be spending this year on some projects and experiments. This may or may not mean more videos, I'm not sure. If it does, some might involve fusion, but most probably won't. So if you're subscribed, I suspect you're probably here for the fusion stuff, but hopefully you'll still find it relevant and interesting. Anyway, thanks for sticking till the end.